movement. And there's um, a, uh, I, I think it's, it's a slightly different um, point of view than many in this room who know uh, and have followed BPA very closely of um, just what kind of challenges uh, reporters are up against. Um, so I have um, been covering Pruitt pretty much from day one. That's, uh, I joined the, uh, Mother Jones at the start of the Trump administration and have reported on environment beforehand. But I was at his confirmation hearing. I reported from, um, at, from the EPA on his first day in office when he delivered a speech. Um, that was the last time for over a year I was invited to the EPA uh, because after that uh, there started to be major changes in the press shop and how they conducted their operations. I will be going into some more details there. Um, that was the time I was still getting emails from the EPA <laughs> announcing um, policy. And um, over time, they, they have admitted that they've um, taken reporters off their press list. Uh, they have changed uh, their operations pretty dramatically in just the availability of information. Um, and uh, at the same time, I noticed how Pruitt was opening the door for outlets that were very friendly to the Trump administration. Um, and I think uh, this, this has been a strategy um, that hasn't been unique to the EPA, but I think um, when you look at what Trump's strategy is in attacking media, um, when you're looking at the bureaucratic implementation of it, EPA is front of the line for uh, really adopting that Trump um, war on press. <coughs> and I apologize for my voice, it's a little hoarse today. Um, so, okay, on to the key challenges, um, which I summarized a bit personally, but I think this is shared by many reporters and press. Um, so, how do you uh, report on EPA actions when the EPA doesn't want you to know about them? Um, like I said, they have been less forthcoming with, uh, with announcements. Um, press calls are, don't happen anymore. <laughs> um, and they also uh, don't invite reporters, at, at least recently, unless um, you are a particularly friendly outlet. And by that, I mean um, Daily Caller, Breitbart, and some conservative press. Um, many reporters have had trouble getting into the EPA when Pruitt is announcing some major initiative. Um, how do you get uh, people in the know to talk to you when they are in professional je jeopardy themselves? There's a lot of talk of whistleblowers and leaks, um, but there are their own challenges built into that and convincing people um, to, essentially there's, there's a trade off there and that's its own challenge. Um, who do you trust? We have very conflicting information, um, obviously from the president's Twitter account and uh, White House officials and um, Pruitt. And I think we saw this play out in the Paris Agreement debate where we were hearing from many different voices and it's a challenge just finding the signal in that noise. Which stories are important enough to get coverage? Um, there's a lot of news happening <laughs> and a lot of changes taking place very rapidly at the EPA. And uh, if you have a bureau with a large team of environmental reporters, maybe you can cover it all. But uh, that's still very rare these days, despite a lot of outlets building up their environmental uh, team. And um, I'm one of a few people at Mother Jones who covers environment, but there's still that call of, do you cover an advance, uh, advance notice of rulemaking, or do you cover when the EPA eliminates a small office? And um, that's another issue. Um, and how do you report on something that hasn't happened yet? Um, this is, uh, I, I was thinking of particularly climate change when giving this example because this is not unique to Trump, uh, that a lot of the environmental challenges we talk about when we're talking about uh, warding off risk to, um, warding off the risk of a spill of, um, of the climate impacts that uh, are yet to come or to intensify. And there's, there's a, an inherent reporting challenge of figuring out um, how do you make that story come alive? Um, and 
this is just an environmental reporting challenge overall, but also when we're talking about what the impact of the Trump administration will be. So at the same time, there are a lot of challenges. There's also a lot of different aspects of um, the EPA story. And um, this, is, this is my personal list. Um, it might not look the same for everyone, but I think there are some major themes that, um, you, that kind of um, divide the EPA story. So one is Scott Pruitt himself uh, could argue that he has probably overtaken many of these other stories of his own ethical, um, ethical problems and um, just what motivates him, why, um, what's his end goal. And a lot of, um, a lot of people say that is uh, running for political office, um, higher political office in the future. Um, so just to dwell a little bit on that first point, um, for my um, profile of Pruitt, I uh, went to Oklahoma to interview people in his life, um, as well as some critics and um, to really understand him better because I wasn't going to get um, a heart to heart with him. And the, I think the, the two pieces of this that get less attention, um, especially, is especially the religious aspect. Um, he comes from this, this conservative evangelical background. And for that story, I talked to his pastor, who's known him for decades, Nick Garland, who um, kind of interpreted for me what, uh, when Pruitt will give speeches explaining his policy, he kind of peppers it with, with some references without really talking about the Bible, but they, they are evangelical references um, that he is using to justify what he's doing at the EPA. So just an example is um, when he's talked in the past about an apple orchard and um, as a kind of his symbolism for why environmentalists are attacking him. He says, environmentalists just want to shut people out of the apple orchard while I want to harvest it to feed the world. That, this is paraphrased, but was essentially the essence of his quote. And he never said, he never said this is coming from my religious views, but um, you can see how this colors his approach at the EPA. So that's one story is him. Um, there's the industry influence at the EPA. I'll go into that in a bit. There is, of course, the regulatory rollbacks and um, the damage to uh, the institution itself of environmental protection and of science and of long-term staff who've worked there. Um, and then, like I've mentioned, uh, EPA as the extension of Trump's war on press. Um, so I'll be going into these more in a bit. This is another image that I thought was great from uh, my story in print, and uh, I put some quotes in this presentation um, that of people I've talked to uh, the last year and a half who I thought um, kind of captured the essence of what it's like and what Pruitt is like. Um, so this one, I think it got a little cut off, but um, Christine Ta Whitman, a former EPA uh, administrator under George W. Bush, um, said that She's never known an administrator to go in with such apparent disregard for the agency. Um, and she said this actually far earlier. She was saying this when Pruitt was nominated for the position. So um, he came in with a attitude um, towards environmental protection. Um, what he's done since is not exactly a surprise given his record uh, as attorney general in Oklahoma. And um, let's see, so I think, um, this also goes back to those religious views of what, what makes Pruitt unique here um, and that he's, coming, he, he's come in with a point of view. Um, so this is kind of an example, I think, of the, the stories about covering Pruitt the person <laughs> versus um, EPA policy. And one, this was a, um, this analysis that I did just because I noticed at the start of the Trump administration about um, a month after Pruitt was confirmed and entered the agency. He, um, I noticed after a, a social media blackout uh, on the EPA's Twitter accounts that they were doing wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Pruitt. And a lot of it was just images of him like shaking hands with politicians, 
Um, it was not very substantive. Uh, so I thought I would compare it to what BPA was doing in the Obama administration um, because it struck me as unusual. And it turns out it was because BPA typically shares information with the public like how to test your water for lead um, and what to do if you have asbestos in your home. Um, these are public information tweets as well as some promotion of the administrator and their activities. Um, so this was just an analysis of, of the Pruitt, the personality, um, and how he kind of over, has overtook very quickly the, the policy and, and all of the rollbacks um, that he had he started to undertake. Um, so, um, yeah, I think this is another theme of Pruitt the man, that, that story, and um, what uh, he, um, how he uses his office um, in um, a unusual way, not so unusual for the Trump administration. And that's, um, so anytime Pruitt has an opportunity to use public objects for private gain, I would raise a red flag. Um, and I think that kind of, that quote from this ethics expert I talked to when Pruitt um, was starting this legal defense fund now, as he faces a lot of federal investigations, um, this, this expert was commenting on the theme of the Pruitt scandals, that he has used his um, a, a public agency to further um, his own purposes. And I think that, that captures actually a, a broad range of what's been happening in, in these scandals that we, we hear about. Um, so I thought I would break down to make a little clearer the um, kind of how I view <laughs> the ethics and the policy, because this is a question I get a lot. Is, are, is the Chick-fil-A story overtaking the uh, rollback of water regulations and um, ozone protection? Um, so uh, these are, this is not a complete list. There's actually, he, I believe he faces, he faces well over a dozen federal investigations right now um, over an audit from the Office of Inspector General over lots of these issues. Um, and um, you've probably heard of many, if not all of them, um, that he used his staff to arrange, and his position to arrange a interview for his wife with uh, Chick-fil-A for a Chick-fil-A franchise, that he also deployed staff to find him um, a ho Trump hotel mattress, <laughs> a used one, um, that he, of course, rented from an energy um, lobbyists and at first did not disclose all the details of that uh, transaction and um, what $50 a night rent is uh, is actually is pretty cheap by DC standards <laughs> so um, and and more recently he has announced the start of a legal defense fund while promising Congress in a hearing that I covered uh, that he would um, that he would disclose uh, all the details about this fund. There's been very little information yet, and um, ethics experts like Kathleen Clark and the other slide um, worry about the minefields ahead that this is just going to be another major issue. Um, also, another story that probably hasn't gotten a ton of attention is that a lot of the people he brought with him from Oklahoma have fled in the last few months. So at least seven staffers, um, political staffers, have quit the last few months, um, many of them have been um, part or dragged into these scandals and, and some of them brought in by members of Congress. Um, so, let's see. And then there's the policy stories, and this is also not a complete list of what's happening at the EPA. Um, but I think um, these, are, these are just as, and probably, I think, more important. <laughs> Um, be when you're looking at long-term damages of what is happening. Um, so changing uh, science advisory boards and how science functions at the EPA. Uh, the waters of the U.S. rule that he has rescinded and has yet to really reveal how they will replace that rule governing what, uh, what the United States considers a waterway that can be federally regulated. Um, just recently, he has announced changes to how the EPA calculates cost and benefit analyses and that uh, 
tilted in industry's favor when you're talking about the costs of uh, regulatory rule. Um, there's fuel efficiency standards for cars that he's in the process of rolling back. Now this is, um, this has major climate implications. Um, and a major question that we are still awaiting an answer on is if he will revoke California's waiver um, that allows it to pursue higher standards. Um, and then we sh oh, I have that, I guess, twice. But science is important, so <laughs> it's, it's fair to, um, to emphasize that. And there are plenty of other ways he's, um, he's affected science. I think, I think I meant to actually put in that he has, uh, he, with announcing a, a secret, quote unquote, secret science um, uh, regulation or, or science transparency, regulation um, that he is uh, changing what scientific studies can be used at the EPA um, and that has major implications for public health regulations. Um, so that just imagine that as the last point. So um, yeah and I, I think I cover both of these um, and just some perspective on um, the, the challenges here again. I think I think the general public, um, at least people who are less in the weeds, as many of the people in the room here are on environment, I think ethics stories are far easier to grasp and they really capture the, the um, they, they get the headline, they, you kind of understand implicitly one sentence explanation what the issue here is and what the potential problems are when you're using your private office or sorry, public office for private gain. Um, but while the public's very interested in that, of course the policy is very important. So I think the, the challenge that I face day to day is uh, what's the right balance between these and it, how much is it possible to find um, where these intersect and, and hopefully bring people and readers to the story, but also get at the longer term impacts of uh, what the Trump administration is doing. So um, here's one example of how I think it's possible to kind of marry those th these areas. Um, and, and one is industry access um, because that is that is a, explains both the ethics and the policy front. Um, so this is a graphic that I um, was also included in this this profile I did on um, the meetings that Pruitt uh, had taken his first year of office. And you can see that uh, any, any trade group with an industry, um, whether it's fossil fuels, agriculture, um, even the chemical industry, far outnumbered environmental and public health groups. Um, and normally in previous administrations, of course, um, the EPA has to and does meet with all of these stakeholders uh, the difference is who is who is really getting a hearing at the EPA and who um, is is being listened to, who is influencing the agenda. Um, and it's I think important to note that we actually don't usually learn about these meetings until months after, and that's because uh, the EPA has broken from uh, past uh, <coughs> sorry um, past precedent and. Um, for a while didn't disclose Pruitt's public schedule and also does not uh, inform reporters of his advanced schedule. And that's something that Trump does, that's something uh, Rick Perry does, even Zinke will do of um, where reporters do generally when he's giving a speech or um, has um, speaking at a conference, um, reporters might get advance notice um, to cover and hopefully ask some questions. But for Pruitt, they operate very secretly we don't normally get advance notice from the EPA, maybe from other areas. And um, it makes it a challenge to even just find out who is influencing the policy. Often there's a big lag for about months or a year to find out who is. Um, so this brings me to another point where um, I think this is actually a personal pet peeve of mine. Um, and that is, <laughs> so the regulatory front. Um, and there's a lot of debate over this because um, rolling back regulations is a very arduous process where it takes um, many steps of 
issuing, um, issuing notice for public comment, collecting those comments, forming a legal justification for rolling back those rules. Um, and also the in environmental law is, is very strong and explicit on what the EPA's role are with regards to uh, ozone, climate, you name it. Um, so many, of, when we're talking about uh, deregulation, um, a lot of uh, the story is still ongoing. It's been a long process. So the Clean Power Plan, while uh, the Trump administration uh, has revoked it, they uh, have had advance notice of rulemaking and many other stages before we really find out um, how they will address the legal question of the EPA needing to address greenhouse gases. Um, the same goes for waters of the US rule and many others. Um, so that's one disclaimer on the, the regulatory rule back front that I think is, is often missed. Um, it, it's a nuance in, in the reporting too um, that I think it's, it's a challenge to just get that across to the reader. Um, and then the other question is, is just how much has he actually accomplished? He, he has a reputation of being uh, very successful uh, and very productive, um, but he's lost a handful of legal battles already and faces many others in courts. Um, the many, um, so environmental experts at Vermont Law School and elsewhere um, would, would argue that Pruitt, um, Pruitt's justification for rolling back regulations will probably not stale, stand legal scrutiny. So if they are eventually overturned, has he really accomplished much? So this is, this is my pet peeve with reporting, actually, because um, that's an important point and probably true. But these court cases take a while to play out. Um, and really, the administration's strategy has been to delay. Um, and I think this gets me to a point about how, um, about what the real damage is. Because I think when you say, well, he'll lose in court, there's no damage, it misses a larger context of the story. And that's something that I try to remember in my reporting that um, I think um, is important to always emphasize. So last year I did a, a Q and A with an EPA staffer and uh, the president of uh, the EPA's uh, local office union, um, so he's um, a regional staffer based out of Chicago. And I asked him, uh, can you tell me where you think the EPA is? Um, give me, project it a few years out. Um, so this is a long quote, but um, basically he, was, he wasn't talking about the regulations. He was talking about the institution and how Pruitt has been hollowing out the institution. Um, I believe the last numbers I saw was um, about at least a thousand people I think have left the EPA since the start of the Trump administration, many of them scientists. Uh, the Trump administration hasn't been quick to reappoint those positions. And um, Pruitt has bragged in tweets about reaching Reagan level, Reagan era levels of EPA staffing. And he, um, so, uh, this, this um, quote, O'Grady was talking about just recruitment, about the future of the EPA. How do you convince people to come in the door when you can't even convince people to stay? Um, so I thought that was a really important point and um, one reason I try to talk to um, both current and recently um, former EPA staffers to truly understand what the impact here is. Um, that we're not just talking about legal battles, um, and high-minded policy that we're talking about the people who do the day-to-day -day work to enforce these rules. So um, let's see, this is the fun part, attacks on press, <laughs> fun part for me. Um, so I just included a few examples of um, where, um, of the specific challenges to covering the CPA. And I think, like I said, this is not unique in the Trump administration. These uh, are challenges throughout, given kind of this, this more hostile environment towards media. Um, and I understand as a reporter for Mother Jones, we are certainly not the most sympathetic outlet to uh, Trump, um, but, and, and we would, um, we keep him accountable, but um, 
I wanted to include a few examples just to show that this is, this is far reaching for lots of um, reporters on the beat. So this was an AP reporter who's done great investigative work on the EPA. He was uh, covering the um, fallout of Hurricane Harvey last year and the EPA, um, I believe it was, I guess it was September, late August, he, um, the EPA issued an unsigned press release attacking this reporter by name um, and then linking to several conservative outlets to get the real news. <laughs> and that's because he reported that the EPA was nowhere to be found at some flooded Superfund sites. Um, so rather than attack the substance of that story, um, it was actually, it was an attack on the person. Um, so this was a tweet where the AP stood by the reporter. Um, this was not the last time he, he kind of skirmished with the EPA. Um, there's also, this, is, this was a very well-known quote of um, the other week when reporters were, well, actually there was a lot that happened, but in this case, um, this was an Atlantic reporter who is not an EPA beat reporter, but has been doing great work on this. Um, who reported on a staffer to leave, um, the latest staffer to leave under Pruitt, and uh, asking for a quote, heard, you're a piece of trash. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, that, that's the, yeah, keeping it classy um, from Mila, who's a great, um, great climate reporter. Um, so yeah, you're not getting answers to your questions is, is kind of the climate we're in. Um, this was also a well-known incident of uh, a water contaminant summit that the EPA uh, orchestrated after some controversy of a report it didn't release. I won't get into all the specifics, but um, it basically when a number of outlets showed up to cover that event, uh, the uh, EPA press shop claimed the event was full, uh, they would not allow them in, and then uh, the, a different AP reporter um, says she was grabbed by a guard and pushed out. Um, and this uh, is just kind of an example of the escalation of, of the, the, um, of the, yeah, this, <laughs> this war on press. Um, this was a, another example, um, very recently I was on a panel um, talking about similar subjects with um, Washington Examiner, which is, um, um, which is a, a more conservative outlet, um, but um, this reporter um, who is, does also great work on energy and um, environment um, of just what is happening these days um, said on this panel uh, that he, uh, he realized the, the EPA was trying to turn him into a mouthpiece um, and expected him to print word for word their own talking points and when he uh, when he resisted, uh, they tried to get him in trouble with his boss. And um, I thought that was really interesting. That was a very rare admission, I think, of what it's like um, and, and um, for um, a reporter who, who has um, had more access to the EPA, what it's been like. <coughs> so, um, this is a bit dated, but last year, um, th just another example of how he opened the door for Trump's favorite network while shutting out others. Um, and Fox News, of course, leads the way. He, um, the one caveat that happened more recently was when Fox News gave him a tough interview um, after a f the energy lobbyist story a few months ago. Um, Pruitt stopped giving interviews. Um, went completely dark, but when he did finally, months later, a few weeks ago maybe, emerged for some interviews, he talked to um, Sinclair and Free Beacon as his first two outlets. Um, so I'm not sure, maybe Fox is no longer his favorite network, um, but he's still going to conservative press to tell his own story. Um, and I will just give a final um, example um, before I wrap up of, of just how this has escalated over time um, with, um, this was a story that I reported on with my colleagues last year that the EPA had hired a Republican uh, political firm to conduct media monitoring, which was to collect media clips, um, which is a normal, that in itself is a normal process, but both the way the contract came about as a, a, a no bid contract and 
the way um, that it was, uh, the, the fact that this was a partisan firm, that made this unusual. Uh, there was a lot of outrage over this, and actually the EPA canceled that contract um, several days later, um, kind of a sign of it was not worth the trouble of fighting this. But um, I, we got a FOIA back recently. <coughs> <coughs> That's a screenshot from CNN, which um, aired this um, after we got this FOIA back. Um, that uh, the emails and documents over this showed, it gave us a little more context of what was happening. And, and over this time, we see this escalation of what's been going on with, with this press strategy. Um, that he was uh, looking for um, a spe special focus in Oklahoma press, um, where he's rumored to want to run for political office, and that he's, um, and that they they called out several conservative media as well as some national media. But it tells us a little more about that contract. So, I will um, end with just kind of, I didn't want to end on a super pessimistic note of just how awful everything is, um, but. <laughs> Um, I think um, there's been a lot of great work done in uh, impact journalism if, since the start, or well, predating the Trump administration. But I think um, we've seen that not all hope is lost. Um, and a lot of that is because um, there are still strategies to overcome all these barriers and still report on these um, substantive stories of how people are impacted. Um, so some of these you've, I'm sure, heard of. Freedom of Information Act is. Um, a great one. The only problem is you often get these emails um, and documents. You could get them anywhere from months to years after the fact. In fact, I think they're predicting the EPA um, th that they will answer current FOIA requests like into 2020 when Trump might not be president. And so it's <laughs> FOIAs are imperfect tool. Um, there's of course whistleblowers and leaks, um, though there's there's inherent um, challenges to that as well. Um, there's public documents just um, because the EPA has to publish uh, what it is doing when it is formally taking action on any regulation or asking for public, uh, public comment. It has to publish it in the Federal Register. So often just reading through these documents, um, whether it's on uh, the science regulation um, or this cost and benefit change, often there's, there's more details on just how um, how they, what they're doing. Um, there's often things that they don't want to publicize, but is in there. Um, so that's been a great tool. Um, and the contract story that I was just talking about also was a public document. Um, I think one more creative strategy we've seen recently are pool systems. Um, that happened uh, earlier this year when the EPA shut out reporters from covering um, one, of, uh, one of its summits. And Fox News actually um, which was allowed to broadcast, um, had a pool system, set up a pool system with outlets like CNN to share footage, which is, is normal for White House coverage, but very unusual for environmental coverage. And I think there's been um, some creative kind of strategies of, of pooling those resources. There is also, of course, going into the field. I would not have learned what I did about Pruitt without um, going to Oklahoma and also just seeing the environmental challenges there and talking to the people who have been fighting the local fights. And um, that uh, also the, talking to the people who are directly affected. Um, and at the end of the day, it's, it's not, I think, about having the big story about, um, or the, the Chick-fil-A story or the profile of Pruitt. It's about building a body of work over time so people come to you for more stories and more ideas. Um, and that's why I think programs that, uh, like this fellowship that bring reporters here to dive deeper are great um, because it's really about work over time and um, reporting accurately um, and transparently in order to, um, to lead to all of these other, um, all of these other uh, successes and uh, story ideas and tips. So I'll wrap up, but just wanted to leave with a quote that um, it's uh, that I think wraps up the true challenges of what's going on in this administration, um, and this was from a, a EPA attorney who recently left after the Obama administration, um, and I think this is 
maybe this is this is obvious on enforcement, on climate, on plenty of issues. So I'll wrap up there, and I guess we can do some questions. Yeah. Any any questions or comments? Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for being here. That was a great talk. Um, one of the uh, traditional aims or principles of journalism is to be objective. Um, and of course, we've seen, uh, especially from the right wing media outlets, uh, complete disregard um, of that traditional aim. Um, I'm wondering how you think that that has affected the left wing or uh, center media's um, thinking about being objective in journalism. Has it caused you to sort of rethink whether the stakes are now not such that um, there's more of a reason to uh, try to influence your audience? Um, and, and if you could just talk a little bit about you know, being objective to the facts or being fair to both sides and uh, whether the media outlets that you work with have been um, affected by the right wing on the establishment, the uh, administration's um, actions to, to discredit you? Yeah, um, great question. I think um, we're, we're in such a, I, I don't think this is exactly new to because of Trump, but we're in this climate where, um, where um, there's a lot of a job as a reporter is, is often um, fact checking uh, other people's claims. So that's not necessarily just Trump, but also um, sometimes these, these memes that might spread in um, some of the, the furthest right press. Um, this before the Trump administration, a lot of my job was actually covering um, kind of trends in climate change denial um, and how um, like the partisanship on climate. And a lot of that is just sometimes it's just responding because I saw this this trope take hold of many outlets um, on on the right that are um, kind of the, the climate skeptic friendly outlets and um, tr just doing a fact check. Um, and that is, I think, aimed not just at an, a Mother Jones audience or, or wherever I was working at the time, um, but it's, it's aimed at people who um, might not know that much about climate and climate science, but it comes across this. And we see how those kind of, these kind of beliefs and, and myths on the science, they, they might start at Breitbart, um, but they actually, you, you can, um, they, they will grow and they, they can end up Wall Street Journal, then on Fox, then Trump's tweet. And it's important to keep an eye on that. Um, I, let's see, I'm not sure if that fully answered your, your question. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. I think all of us are still trying to evolve and adapt to this. Um, I think um, you, you see the New York Times trying different strategies of how do you, how do you call a president's um, tweet false in a headline, but also <laughs> Be fair and objective. Um, so there's there's a lot of inherent challenges there, um, and I mean I also I also talk just for my job to um, skeptics, to conservatives, to industry interests. I, I do a, I, I speak to a range of voices um, often, and it's not just about objectivity. Um, it's it's often just understanding um, understanding the the interests pushing this where they might be headed, what, what proposals they want to see, it can be really informative. So um, I think just um, not talking to a, a kind of a select, um, going back to the same sources, but expanding are, is really important. I, I have a question, Rebecca. The, uh, one of the challenges of, of our system of government is, and, and of reporting on it, is if you're in DC and you're inside the Beltway, there's a degree to which Everything seems to revolve around EPA, but in the, in the world of environmental protection, the states have become major players. And I wonder if um, there's opportunities for you, or you maybe you have done some work in this area, to either report on where states are stepping up to fill the, fill the void, or places where the states are taking advantage of EPA's lack of a presence and <laughs> in, in kind of rolling back state level enforcement. Yeah, yeah that's it. I'm glad you brought that up um, because I think. That's very important, and DC can be very, is very federally focused. Um, 
oftentimes, but that's not where the action these days, or there, there's plenty of action happening at the state level. Um, so I think on the, on the states that are probably taking advantage of this situation, um, that are relaxing their enforcement and oversight, um, that story to me, and may, maybe I'm wrong, um, is I, I think that takes time to develop to really see that happen, um, because a lot right now it's also a lot of confusion, and um, when um, they announce they're doing something of what's actually happening, will it stand in courts? So I think for seeing the impacts of states pulling back too, um, I, I feel like that story, that's a, that's a story I, I hope to do focus on increasingly because I think that is where the story will be now that we're a year plus and increasingly into the Trump administration of um, how this plays out in, um, in, in the states. For the states doing strong work, um, though there's plenty of them, California, um, of course, often tops the list. Um, I think there's a lot, um, I think from, for, for national reporters, a lot of it is often um, kind of framed as the uh, California takes on the Trump administration, and there's often that, that federal focus still um, when we're talking about climate policy. But um, I mean, I'm, I, I think there is, it, it's important, of course, to cover that and not overstate the Trump administration's impact. Um, that goes back to the regulatory rollbacks problem um, in reporting is, is um, that the, the Trump administration doesn't have all this all power here. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be covering when um, California uh, has its climate summit uh, this fall um, to say we're still in on Paris Agreement and these are all the, the um, subnational actors that still are. Um, I'm going to be there covering that, so I'm, I'm hoping to also transition to that. Um, but I, yeah, I think, I hope, and I think um, outlets try to keep that in mind. I, I think because we are in this world of a lot of really um, tough news cycle and, and depressing stories often, I think um, there's often an attempt to like keep in the back of your head. Like I also want to, I don't want to just tell what's, what's um, going wrong here. There's also positive news. Are there other questions? I've got one if no one else has one. All right, so here's another one. That, that uh, you know, it seems to me that professionally, both as environmental lawyers and, and policy, you know, makers, uh, you know, the, the, fo the kind of work where the, many of the students are here studying has the significant overlap of the question that you described of how do you decide what to cover? And that's become increasingly challenging with climate change and, you know, now, the environment is not just about some pollution coming out of a pipe or a smokestack. It's about our food systems. It's about our energy systems. It's about you know response to extreme weather events and land use and resilience to you know um, all that. So there's just there's a fascinating array of things, and I wonder just for you as a professional, you know, to share with certainly for the students in the room, how do you begin in such an amazingly complex? an intricately connected world, how do you begin to untangle that and pick something that you can really focus on effectively? Yeah, wow, that's a great question. And I think I'm still kind of learning, it, it, the, especially this news environment is so kind of frazzled. I'm still actually learning um, how, how do you, which battles to pick. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think, well, start when I, when I was starting to cover environment, I think um, it, it felt, it is, it is such a big beat. Um, when I say environment to people who don't know much about environment, they uh, think, they're like, oh, this is a really niche issue. But um, of course, the environment encompasses all of these areas. Um, and that's, that's what I love about covering it, um, that it, it is, it's so substantive and um, tangled. Um, I think, um, I try, I, let's see, trying to kind of pick, it's hard to pick an issue, but I, I think everything is so promising to look at that you just pick one issue, um, you learn, read as much about it as possible, learn about it, and I think it introduces, it, it's, in, it's introduced me to many other of the aspects of environmental coverage that I didn't consider before um, when covering um, especially issues like climate change, which touches on everything. Um, I'm not someone who knows very much about animals um, or kind of traditional conservation, but uh, I've learned a lot in the process on, about public lands and land management policy um, in that process. 
of kind of um, of diving into one area. Um, and I think kind of picking a strategy, um, going back to the um, slide where um, talking about reporting strategies, it's, it's of course as a, a student of the law, it would be, it would be different, but um, kind of narrowing down a, um, how am I, not narrowing down, but how do I get my information? Where do I get my information from? Um, and uh, maybe it's worth expanding the outlets you read or um, talking to uh, kind of different voices than you'd expect and the people perhaps impacted by these rules rather than the, just the law professors. Um, I think it also um, kind of gives you that, that rounded approach um, to, to learning more about an issue. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, she, she Ling, and then um, in the middle here. Yeah. Maybe if, can I just shout my yeah, yeah, go for it. I'll bring this up as I you're talking. I hear that you can set their reporter pool to be involved in that. Here you write that Fox helped set up a reporter's pool that involved CNN reporters? Yeah. And, and oh, sorry, let me ask the second part of the question. Do you feel like uh, in this climate you are more alienated or less alienated to say Wall Street Journal reporters? Um, well, oh, okay. I, I hope I, I understand this properly. But on, on the pool systems, um, yeah, um, so there, this was in response to a specific incident. And unfortunately, I actually just don't recall what prompted this. I, it was one of the many speeches Pruitt gives um, from the comfort of the EPA. Um, it it might have been on the science regulation. But um, yeah, where, where um, it was kind of a reactive. It wasn't a proactive. We know that this Pruitt does this on everything. So we're going to now set up a pool system. It was in that one instance. Um, where um, network, the networks banded together. Um, it's, it's, right now, it's hard to see if that's a trend, if there will be more of that kind of strategy now that reporters are shut out of, of lots of things and not just um, the EPA. Um, but I thought it was, it was a really interesting, creative approach. Um, and you saw that with the contaminant summit, too, when sh reporters were shut out, um, that there was a lot of kind of media support of, of those reporters and outreach. Um, there were some reporters who were in that summit, including um, Politico on the first day and a few others. Um, so I think there was, there was some, um, there was a lot of support there. Um, alienation from, from other outlets. I'm, I'm hoping I'm, I'm understanding this, this question. Um, uh, there, but I think um, we're, Journalism is a really competitive environment, but I think um, because all the challenges we're facing are shared, um, ex um, unless you are um, working for a, a the very favorite Trump outlets, like Breitbart is, is the top of that list, um, I think if, if you're committed, if your publication's committed to facts and honesty, um, I think there is a lot of um, kind of shared support, especially in this climate. Last question. Sorry, hey. Um, so I spend a good bit of my time um, dealing with compliance issues and folks that operate power plants and build transmission lines and stuff like that. And so I spend a good bit of my time telling them to ignore the headlines and ignore the news, and that's not really happening, and it's not going to happen, and trying to explain the why not, and you know, the, to your earlier point. Um, same thing with some, when something passes the House, right? It's not really going anywhere. It's just, it, it just makes for headlines. So how do you, how do you, balance that with a, with a real need for advocacy and people to be aware and be engaged and all that kind of stuff way before these things get fully baked. And how do you balance that thinking? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really tough one because I think um, I'm often, when I talk to um, especially the environmental advocacy world, the NRDCs that are suing over um, all these rules, um, I, there's kind of two talking points. There's one that this is this is truly damaging and going to change everything. And the other one is we're going to win in the end, so it doesn't matter. And those are conflicting. <laughs> I, I think you hear this on clean energy too. Um, and, and I mean, you, clean energy has continued to be um, very strong um, economically, but um, there's also the actions at the same time Trump is undertaking to subsidize coal, um, which could change things potentially. So 
there is that need of like not warning the sky is falling every minute because um, often these things play out somewhat differently in the real world. Um, it's hard to, I, the answer to that is really difficult, which is <laughs> why um, we're, both, we're both struggling with it of um, like what, and it goes back to what's the news here. Um, and I think, I think it's just like the context is really important. I think um, another reason I really love the environmental beat is I think the people covering it are, are very knowledgeable and care about what they're covering. So they learn the policy, they learn the history. Um, I, when Trump came in, read up on um, the Reagan administration's EPA to figure out, well, what's new here, what isn't. Um, so I think that that kind of context and historical context is always really important to include in stories, if not also just learn it um, to realize some of what we're seeing is new, but some of it we've seen before, and the country came out of it with stronger environmental uh, regulation in the end when we're talking about the Reagan administration. Well, on that positive note, <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you all.